I've got a great congregation. You folk really helped me in my sermon preparations. You're constantly sending me emails with funny stories and uh, tales to tell, something that I can use to illustrate a sermon. I really appreciate your help. Recently, I received this story from one of you. You know who you are. <laughs> when I read it, the first thing I thought was, this is why I teach an adult Bible study. Okay, here's the scene. Sunday morning. Sunday school starting. It's a preschool class. And the teacher is teaching her class of little ones about Jesus and how to be a Christian. And then she asks her class this. Children, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale, and gave all my money to the church, would I get to heaven? And all the children shouted out, No! If I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, and kept everything neat and tidy, would I get into heaven? And again, they responded, No! Well, how can I get into heaven? There was a pause of silence. Then a little five-year-old boy shouts out, You gotta be dead! <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be dead! That doesn't seem fair, does it? <clears throat> I want to know what heaven is like before I die. I want a sneak preview. I want something that I can hold in my hands and touch and feel and see and smell. And I want to experience heaven before I enter in. I want to know, is heaven a real place? Is it really worth the effort in serving God this side of eternity? I want to know. And I think you're with me on this. I really do. I mean, mankind has always been interested in life after death. <clears throat> What's our next home going to be like? Artists paint beautiful pictures of what they perceive as heaven. You go to Rome, the Sistine Chapel, and you have a picture of God and heaven. Songwriters and musicians, they love to sing about heaven. I mean, who can forget that classic? I dreamed I was there in hillbilly heaven. <laughs> and if you log on the internet and you type in Google heaven, you get zillions of places that you can go in that search engine uh, just from that one word, heaven. Even Hollywood has tried to portray what the next life will be like. In 19... 98, Robin Williams starred in the movie, What Dreams May Come. Now this is the story of a doctor who dies in a tragic road accident, and in the afterlife, he searches heaven and hell for his wife. His spirit arrives in heaven, and heaven is filled with clouds and technicolor, and uh, little children are flying. And it's just a beautiful, magical place, <coughs> grand cities. He even teams up with his old dog who had died before him. In this version of heaven, you can even rescue the one, the loved one, who was sent to hell. <coughs> In the movie Ghost, Hollywood tries to answer the question of what happens to you when you die. And basically what we learn is that if you've been good, then there's a very soft, sweet experience of you floating up to heaven. And if you're bad, there are these black, scary creatures that come crawling uh, out after you and drag you into hell. And in one of my favorite movies, Field of Dreams, starring Kevin Costner, we learn that heaven is not Iowa. That's it. <laughs> what, what more can I say? <laughs> but there is a lot of interest in heaven. I mean, what's it like? What will our home in heaven be like? <clears throat> the best source of 
for information is the Bible. So I want us to take a look at the book of Revelation. Um, this is going to be what, where we're going to learn about heaven. The Apostle John is the author. He wrote this book while serving out a punishment by the Roman government. John has been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, a barren island, about the size of um, Mackinac Island, but without the trees, okay? And, and, and John is here on this island. It's not a very pleasant place. It's barren, it's desolate. It's a place where you go to die. John is sent to Patmos for the crime of being a Christian. And it's there that he's given this miraculous vision, this revelation uh, concerning prophecy and what's going to happen in the end times. The end times. Now that's a topic for another sermon. We're not going to talk about the end times today. We're going to talk about, talk about heaven. But toward the end of Revelation chapter 21, John gives us the glimpse we want. He begins uh, by saying that he saw a heaven and a new earth. And then in verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a beautiful bride prepared for her husband. The very first thing we learn is that heaven is a holy city. It is a holy place. And then further on in the chapter, verse number 27, we're told that nothing evil will be allowed to enter. No one who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty. A new, a holy city. Heaven's not a cloud. Heaven is not some celestial retirement home. Heaven is not a place of never-ending church sermons. Sitting in church in a hard pew and listening to a preacher or sing hymns from a hymn book. That is not heaven. I say that because when I was a young boy, I would think about heaven. And I would worry. I worried that heaven was a place of Perpetual Sundays. <laughs> there would be church services that would go on and on for eternity. No breaks. Hard pews. Smelling incense. I figured that if I went to heaven, I'd have to give up playing baseball and going to the movies and having a girlfriend. And I was so worried about going to heaven that I was afraid to die. I mean, let's face it, when you're growing up, earth is far more interesting than heaven. <laughs> well, I'm grown up, and I've been studying God's word, and I realize I may have been wrong about heaven. Heaven is a holy city. Now, when I think of city life, I think of activity and working and interacting with fellow citizens. When I think of city, I think of adventure and Great places to eat, and family, and friends, and neighbors. Verse 16, John describes this city as a perfect cube. He said it's a square, as wide as it is long. In fact, it was in the form of a cube. And then he goes on to say that heaven has walls made of jasper. The city was pure gold and foundation stones inlaid with 12 gems. And then in verse 21, the 12 gates made of pearls. And then he says that the main street is gold. This is my kind of place. I think I'm gonna enjoy heaven. <clears throat> I remember a visit to Toronto we made. We were celebrating our anniversary, I believe, right? And we went to Toronto. We took the train out of Windsor. And 
we didn't have to rent a car because once we got to our hotel, everything we wanted to see was within walking distance. We went to see Phantom of the Opera, and we ate in some very nice restaurants. And in the evening, uh, my wife and I, we went out walking in Toronto at night in this part of town, and we never felt threatened. We felt safe. It was just a wonderful experience. Took a tour bus. They told us about all the sights you could see and how great a city Toronto is, and you know what it is. I remember getting back home and thinking, boy, I wish Detroit was like that. And I could go to all these exciting places and walk the streets and not feel afraid. Detroit may never be like Toronto. Dearborn may never be like Toronto. But heaven, heaven is a perfect place. It's a holy place, a holy city, made holy because this is the dwelling place of our God. And if you're one that would rather live in the suburbs, I believe that heaven has suburbs. And it's a great place to live. There's something else that John tells us about heaven. He says it's a place of holy joy. In verse 3, the home of God is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. He will remove all their sorrows. There will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. A few years ago, Diane Sawyer uh, asked, in an interview, asked the actress Julia Roberts, if you were designing heaven, what would you put in it? This was her answer. I would have music, dancing, and everyone could have wings in whatever color they wished. And then, as an afterthought, Julie, Julia ans uh, added, that her choice of color for wings would be green. Julia Roberts. She wasn't even close describing heaven. <laughs> I mean, heaven is so much more. No sorrow. No death. No crying. You won't find hurt. You won't find pain. The separation that we experience when a loved one goes on before us and the hurt we have and the void, it'll vanish in God's heaven. No more tears. No more things that cause tears. This is how the Peterson translation reads of chapter 21, verse 3. God has moved into the neighborhood making his home with men and women. They're his people. He's their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. And the first order of things gone. It's difficult for our finite minds to wrap ourselves around this picture of a place that is perfect joy and peace. It's hard because we're surrounded by everything that's so negative. In the news, on television, in our neighborhoods, violence and, and hurt, terrorism, so much suffering and pain. A few years ago, a few weeks ago, not years, he hasn't been president that long. A few weeks ago, President Trump signed an executive order <clears throat> banning travel into the U.S. <clears throat> for citizens from seven countries. Seven countries that are considered uh, home to terrorist groups. And he assured us that this action was going to protect us and that we would feel safe. Well, a federal judge put a halt to that. And the government appealed, and, and now there's legal arguments, and I don't know where this is all going to go. <clears throat> if you agree with Trump, 
that you believe we are in constant danger and this ban will protect us from terrorism and we will feel safe. If you disagree with Trump, you'll point out that there has never been a terrorist attack since 9-11 by people from these seven countries and we're just as safe as we can be. Well, Trump or no Trump, I don't really feel that safe. When we were flying to California and we had to go through our baggage check and the TSA agents look at you and you get screened and all that, <coughs> that does not make you feel safe. And I found myself when I got boarded the plane looking at all the passengers, looking to see if there was someone who, you know, we might want to keep an eye on. I did not feel safe. I didn't feel safe until we landed. That's the kind of world we live in. But God has a place now prepared for us. Death is gone for good. Tears are gone. Crying is gone. Pain is gone. We will never live in a place this side of eternity with this type of an atmosphere. Boy, but one day, we're going to live in a holy place with holy peace and with holy joy. And there's something else about heaven. John says in verse 23, the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its light. Now, a thousand years before John wrote this, Isaiah shared his vision in chapter 60, verse 19, and he said, No longer will you need the sun or moon to give you light, for the Lord your God will be your everlasting light. He will be your glory. And then Jesus said to John the Apostle in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't be stumbling through the darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Friends, that is holy light. That is everlasting light. I read this in the uh, paper not long ago. Did you know that scientists are using a robotic NASA probe to determine with precision the age of our universe? And they have determined that our universe is 13.7 billion years old. And they say that with some confidence. They've announced that they have pinpointed the time <coughs> when stars began to shine. And the experts say that the stars started shining about 200 million years after the theoretical Big Bang event that created the universe. One scientist said that the instruments on his uh, space probe have returned a gold mine of new results. We have produced a new, detailed, full sky picture of our infant universe, the afterglow of the Big Bang. It's brought the universe into sharp focus. I remember after I read this, the passage that came to mind from God's word, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, thank you, NASA. Thank you, scientists. Now I know when this happened 13.7 billion years ago, God creating the universe, there was a big bang. He spoke it into being. And then in verse 2, the earth was empty, a formless mass cloaked in darkness. This lasted for 200 million years. Can you imagine 200 million years of total darkness? No suns, no stars. And then in verse 3 of Genesis, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Wow. Just think, for 200 million years, there was total darkness. 
What a dismal, depressing world this would have been. A world without light, without the sun, without life. I don't know about you, but I'll take sunshine over darkness <coughs> any day. I'll take sun over rain. I spent a week in California where it was sunny. And then, you can thank me, I brought it back <laughs> to Michigan. It's raining in California now. I don't want to be in California this week. I like being in an area where there's sunshine and warmth. And this is what we will have when we get to our heavenly home. Light and warmth. A place that is illuminated by God's holiness. No shadows. No sickness. No darkness. No stumbling around in the dark. And saints of heaven walk on solid avenues of gold. We have all that waiting for us. And then finally, in Revelation 21, verse 27, a promise that we'll have a new address. A new listing in the white pages. <laughs> Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. No one who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. A new address. Back in 1992, I remember when we were given a new address. I've been pastoring a church here in Michigan, and then I accepted the position of being the business manager for the Evangelical Church District, four states, and I would manage everything from an office in Anderson, Indiana. Now this was an appointment and we were going to move everything to Anderson. We did this via telephones, telephone calls, faxing, no email then. And I remember that I contacted the um, Cross Lakes apartment in Anderson and talked to the manager. They faxed me a form. I filled it out. I faxed it back. They, I made sure they got their deposit money. Had no idea what the apartment looked like. But I remember the moving day. Big truck pulled up to the church. We loaded up everything we own on that truck. And off we went south to Indiana. When we arrived, we went over to the office. We still had not seen our home. But I signed a contract, I was given a key, we walked over to the apartment very, for the very first time looking at our new address. Opened the door, looked around, okay this is home now. And they unloaded everything and we had a new address. Can you imagine the apprehension we must have felt getting ready for that move? Would you move to a new address sight unseen? I hope not. <laughs> That's what happens when you're in the ministry, though. God's Word assures us we're going to have a new address, and He gives us a peek. He gives us a glimpse. There can be no great surprises. We're going to enter into God's eternity, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We'll be allowed to relocate. Holy address. You see, heaven is a, an ex exclusive place. It's kind of a gated community, if you know what I mean. Uh, holy address. I, I wouldn't want it any other way. Not just anybody can walk in. It says, your name better be in the book of life. Not long ago, I saw a bumper sticker on an old beat-up pickup truck. It said, Heaven doesn't want me, and hell is afraid I'll take over. <laughs> I remember thinking, buddy, you got that all wrong. <laughs> Heaven does want you. And believe me, if you go to hell, you won't be taking it over. 
Jesus died for every one of us so that we might relocate one day that we might go to that heavenly city. We have to accept his salvation. We have to accept the gift of God. And the person whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life will enter into that holy city. All you have to do is make a conscious decision to turn your life over to Jesus and serve him. He's number one. Well, I feel better. I've always had this curiosity about heaven. This is the first sermon I preached here on heaven. It's helped me. I know that one day, because of the book of Revelation, I'm on my way to a holy city. I'm on my way to a place with holy light and holy joy. And a lot of that joy is going to come because I'm going to see my mom again and my dad and my brother and friends who are close to me. And you're going to see some of your loved ones. Isn't it worth serving Jesus just to know there's a place like that? Amen. Thank you.